inclusive. So, um, basically, at inclusive, what we're trying to do is to create uh, what we call trust environments. Um, today, if you have tried to access any product, uh, probably let's say an e-commerce platform out of the country, sometimes they do not list countries like Ghana. It's basically because there's no one to vouch for you or to verify your identity. So essentially what we are doing is to build a pan-African identity infrastructure that allows it or makes it possible for Africans to participate in the global economy so that we can say that uh, Kwame or Madame Esla, we can know who she is basically and then say we are willing to do business with you. So essentially that is what we do at Inclusive. We are building identity infrastructure for the continent. Um, to your question, uh, when it comes to financial services, because there's a diverse group of people here, I'll try to be very, very direct and use plain English. So FinTech or financial technology really means something simple. It means how do we basically deliver financial services through digital channels? Some of these channels include your mobile phone, okay, through the web browser sitting behind the computer so that you don't need to Go, uh, spend money to walk long distances in order to, you know, access a service. You should be able to sit in the comfort of your home and open a bank account with EcoBank or Fidelity Bank, irrespective of where you find yourself. You should be able to um, sit in the comfort of your home and say, I want to buy a stock exchange on the Ghana stock market or the New York stock exchange, you know. And so, basically, what we do as fintechs is to be really agile and rapid to develop infrastructure that is secure, compliant, and also innovative to make the delivery of financial service really, really easy cost and cost effective. Okay. And um, uh, for those uh, tech people in, in, in the audience, you, you would probably have noticed that there are quite a few tech, um, uh, fintech-based innovations like ExpressPay, SlidePay, um, that invest edX, I think, uh, that are coming onto the market. These are all examples of, of fintech uh, technologies. Um, I'm going to go all the way to the end to Edmund. Um, one thing I noticed was, uh, especially for you and Carl, uh, your, your titles uh, in terms of the departments you used to uh, head have moved, it used to be M commerce or something related with commerce, and now it's more broad to um, mobile financial services. And I think this is in response to the fact that um, you know digital finance goes beyond just the the, the payments and the trading. It involves quite uh, a lot. Um, Edmund, can you speak to how um, this expanding uh, how Etel Tigo is going to uh, respond to this expanding role? Uh, particularly with, uh, with, with an eye to financial inclusion. Um, and, and both to the technologies uh, that you're looking at, but also maybe the business models. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And you can tell people a little bit about yourself first. Okay. My name is Edmond Bewa. I'm the head of uh, mobile financial service at Airtel uh, Ghana. Now Airtel Tigo. Yeah. <laughs> so I think you rightly said uh, when mobile money started, the departments within the sector were referred to as uh, M-Commerce. Yeah. Now, indirectly, you are referring to payments uh, online. Mm -hmm. We've grown beyond just uh, payments. Now, you can actually use the mobile money to uh, access services like a savings product right on your phone. Mm -hmm. um, you can use it to access services like uh, loans products. So in terms of the ecosystem and what's mobile money does within the ecosystem. We have actually moved from one space where we were just using mobile money as a means of transferring funds from uh, Accra to your mother in the village, and we've gone beyond that. Mm -hmm. Today, you have uh, online markets that accept mobile money. We are growing. We haven't gotten there yet. The opportunity is huge, and the excitement uh, within that space grows whenever I meet uh, the likes of uh, Paul and uh, I remember the first, my first engagement with, with him was about four years ago at MES, um, um, right? Good. Now, all these institutions are making an impact in terms of what technology can do within the financial uh, services uh, space. If you pick even institutions like banks and uh, other financial institutions, the traditional mode of accepting uh, cash at the sale is long gone. Mm -hmm. 
Today, you can walk to an agent, load your uh, mobile money account, and move the funds straight into your bank account. Yeah. What that means is that you are offering uh, convenience to the customer, which is very key. The time and the money you will spend in moving from one bank branch to the other, you save it through engaging uh, using uh, mobile money or technology to uh, uh, access these services. So the ecosystem is huge. We are not there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, the opportunity is very huge for other players to actually play within the space. And collaboration is the way, uh, from our point of view, uh, mm -hmm. collaboration is the way to go, to be able to expand and access the opportunity that exists within the financial services space. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so, Carl, the first time I, I met you, uh, my first meeting I had with Carl, I, I, went, I met him at his office, and on my way upstairs, I did the splits, and my pants were completely ripped. I had the whole meeting hiding my feet underneath the table. Um, but the thing that Carl, Carl told me, something that blew my mind, and I almost stood up and revealed everything, but he, uh, Vodafone Cash was, was late to the game um, uh, in Ghana, but in a very short period, he was able to sign up quite an impressive number of, of people um, onto the platform. Um, and so, Carl, before you share a little bit about uh, w uh, what you do, um, I, wanted, I want you to uh, speak a little bit to the, the mobile m and companies uh, in terms of digital finance, you're, you've become the anchors. Part of the change of what uh, the regulations that uh, the Bank of Ghana introduced uh, in 2015 was to try and uh, change the incentive structures because the banks were leading it and they were dragging their feet, so to speak. Sorry, Paul. Um, but you, you guys have taken over. Now, what are you doing uh, as sort of the incumbents now to, to ensure that uh, these fintech companies that are coming up, like Pulse, like uh, you know, others that are probably just being dreamt up at the moment, can play with you so you don't make the same mistakes the bank did, which was be hesitant um, uh, in terms of partnering with uh, you know, new entities that were coming up? That's a loaded question. <laughs> okay, so um, usually when I, when I meet people who um, are new to, to this particular field, I like to put things in perspective. So... Today, right, uh, for an average uh, Ghanaian, maybe might live up to s maybe 60 years, mm -hmm. right? If they need to transfer money every day from maybe 18 years, let's say 18 years, they need to transfer money, and it takes them 30 minutes to do a transaction five days of the week, right? 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. By the time you are 60, and hopefully uh, you are not gone, but mm -hmm. if you go at 60, what it means is that you'd have, been, you'd have spent a year of your life transacting, uh, sending money from one point to the other. One year. I mean, I don't know what you tell God when you meet him and say, I spent one whole year out of 60 uh, doing very basic financial services. So it's a crime if we don't provide uh, such services to our own people. It's like, it, that's how I see it. It's, it's, it's a crime. Okay. So in terms of, of, of the way telcos look at it, I, I, we always look at it from four main points. One is convenience, mm -hmm. okay? Now, we realized um, that the handset provides you with that tool that helps you leapfrog you know, all the issues you'd have had if you really had to just send money to somebody in Kumase. It provided us the opportunity to, first of all, make a call. It gave us the opportunity to send messages. Yeah. Then we started using the internet. And then now we said, okay, we could actually use it for an ATM or you know, services that an ATM would have, would have provided anyway. So convenience was, was the first one. Yeah. Second one was accessibility. So we walk out there and you see so many agents. Uh, we had to work on business models to make sure that people would actually start their own businesses. Mm -hmm. And what that did was to say, although we had maybe a little over a thousand bank branches, we were able to get over a hundred thousand agent points, mm -hmm. right? So that provided accessibility. I didn't have to go, I don't have to go uh, drive 30 minutes or uh, walk for an hour to get to. Uh, a financial point. I can do that once I get out of my house. That's, that's it. So I've looked at uh, convenience, I've looked at accessibility, affordability. You know, 
nowadays people say a lot of things around you know what the charges are and everything but i just remember a few years ago if you had to send money to somebody in kumase first of all you knew you were supposed to part with about five to ten percent of the amount mm -hmm. you would give it to a driver that you didn't know from adam um, you would trust this person to actually send this money to to new plan in kumase and you collect a number Hopefully, you trust that you send the money to the place and there won't be any accident on the way. So, you see, we've come a long way. Okay? We've come a long way. Um, so, that's around our affordability. So, we provided the systems in such a way that it was affordable for people to use. And the last one is really around simplicity. So, um, a lot of people wonder, why don't these... Um, financial service providers uh, have all these complicated stuff to send the money. We looked at it and said, people found it very easy to actually use the mobile phone. So let's use the same technology. Let's not go above them. I mean, we, we are very, you know, we, we always have this way of developing products and services that are above the people we want to develop them for. Mm -hmm. So it was very, very important that we came down to the level mm -hmm. of the people we wanted to serve. You know, so simplicity, providing services that were easy to use. I know uh, you can use any phone. You didn't have to have a complicated handset. Um, now you even have some people who transact over IVR in local languages and all that. So these were just ways of providing uh, these services in a very simple manner. Let me just leave it here. Okay. Thank you very much. And actually, that's a, that's a great lead up. This idea of putting the clients or the customer at the center of the service that you're delivering. Um, I had some pretty tough questions for, for Patrick lined up, uh, but in our sort of our pre-talk, he brought up some interesting points about how the banks are, are preparing to basically uh, respond to this uh, sort of client-centric way of, of viewing um, of money ownership. Um, so, uh, Patrick, um, maybe uh, you know, share a little bit about yourself and what you do, uh, your role at Stambik, uh, but then also tell us a little bit about the uh, PSD2 um, what it is so that our audience can be enlightened um, and what that means uh, for you as, as a bank uh, within this ecosystem um, of, of fintechs. Okay, thank you. Um, so part of my role at Stambik, um, which is called Emerging Payment, is understanding this complex world of technology um, so that we as banks understand how to interact with our customers in this digital age uh, and most importantly understand all these other players now eating our cake, um, the yeah. fintechs <laughs> and, and the telcos. Um, so that's part of the work that I do yeah. at Stabic. Um PSD2 is a payment services directive issued in Europe. Uh, when I say that any banker worth his tie um, should have read it twice back to, back to front, uh, because it, it really defines what is going to happen with technology and banking. Um, and the European banking block happens to be the biggest block. So normally the rest of the, the banks follow suit in terms of best practice. The PSD2 allows players like Paul um, to take advantage of our customer base at banks. So it actually mandates banks to open up their customer bases to fintechs um, on the principle that the customer ultimately makes the buying decision. So the customer, even though um, has an EcoBank account, for example, will prefer to use SlidePay to buy airtime. It's a purchasing decision the customer wants to make. So no bank or no player should restrict the customer from doing that. Now, you can imagine what, what that means, right? Yeah. Um, if you're a bank like Bank of America or you're some, a big global bank operating in Europe now. Or Ghana Commercial Bank. Or, or Ghana Commercial <laughs> Bank. Um, GCB. Or, or GCB oh. Bank. Right? Yeah. Uh, it, would, it would mean that your customer base is built over 100 years. It's now accessible to a, a fintech player who is invested close to nothing, right? In, in fact, it mandates the banks to make their systems easy for the fintechs to be able to connect into, yeah. right? And that's, that's pretty powerful legislation, um, yeah. which really guides the conversation around where customers or what customers think of banks, yeah. right? I mean, a bank is not a place you go to, something that you want to do um, yeah. towards your certain lifestyle. And, and customers really, to, to um, Carl's point, want a bit more convenience yeah. where traditionally the banks have been deficient and so the fintechs have stepped in. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's pretty powerful legislation and, and I think it informs our, 
are thinking a lot, Stambic Bank around how we partner in the ecosystem to really meet the customer at the point they are making the buying decision. Um, so, for example, if you're a customer and you prefer to pay your tithe at Sorry Bar, that's, yeah. that's within your right to do that. We want to be the one helping you do that. Um, okay. And I think that's why you see today a lot more banks collaborating with fintechs um, so that the fintechs, even though are assessing our consumer base, are actually giving us new ways of mm -hmm. meeting the customer um, in terms of that buying decision. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, obviously, the, the question that comes up is about regulations. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have a, a regulator from Bank of Ghana specifically uh, around. But I want to find out from your experience, what do you think? Um, I know you had some reservations about the version of the, uh, of the PSD2 that's going through the, the Ghana parliament at, at the moment. Uh, you don't feel it has the full punch that will allow... Uh, for the client to have the full powers that uh, they need. But what other regulations, uh, and this goes uh, to, uh, to both Paul and, and the rest of you, do you think, um, or what needs to change in the regulatory environment to really uh, allow for the kind of uh, experimentation and innovation uh, that y your organizations are aspiring to? Yeah. So I'll speak to one uh, regulation that's actually happening in Europe for which I think actually Ghana is well matched up, and it has to do with data protection. So in Europe, uh, by first quarter 2018, um, the European Parliament would have passed what we call the uh, GDPR, the um, Global Data Protection Regulation. And basically, the core tenant of that regulation means that you need to enable the customer to give consent to how his data is used, okay? Uh, one of the things I actually realized when uh, we are going through our data protection uh, 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 issuance was the fact that actually our regulation, our Data Protection Act, is quite standard and meets mm -hmm. some of those tenets. Mm -hmm. What we haven't done well, though, is to enable the infrastructure to do that. So that today, if I'm filling a, a, a form, okay, to open a bank account, yes, there's a box that says I can tick that box, and I agree to specific terms and conditions. Once I do that, it means that I've given the bank or the fintech institution the power to use my data as and when they want. But you, to give true power to the, uh, to the customer, you need to be able to empower them to actually give consent at the point of transaction. And so that is where I think we need to begin looking at. How can we enable infrastructure, it's especially as our uh, business landscape is becoming increasingly digital? That means that if I'm sitting in Tamale and I want to open a bank account or do a banking transaction, how will I enable that customer to be able to give consent, even if he's not physically you know, present? Um, that is why players like us have come into the space, to be able to build, for example, we're building a national ID infrastructure. That is a fundamental uh, layer of infrastructure. But you need to also build something we call the consent system, which India has done with their ADHA uh, infrastructure. Enabling each and every Ghanaian to say that at every point in time, if their data is going to be assessed, they can say yes or no to that, okay? So in terms of regulation, Ghana has done well. Uh, our Data Protection Act is good, but how do we enforce and, uh, compliance and how do we make sure that the infrastructure is easily available to any kind of innovator? It could be a banker, a developer sitting in the school, because innovation comes from everywhere. So we need to be able to create easy, accessible infrastructure that anyone, anywhere who has a great idea could be able to access and use, but also make sure that they are in compliance with the law. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, building on that point, and you guys can speak uh, to your, uh, what you want to see in regulations as well. Um, I know for mobile money, I mean, this whole KYC process, you know, it, it's convenient not to have it uh, because it, 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 you know, it lowers the bar to entry, but it's important to have for, uh, you know, uh, various customer protection and also even national security, uh, right? So this whole idea that Paul is raising about consent uh, for every transaction, is that something you jive with or, or you know, is that something that you want to see? And, and what else in terms of the regulatory environment? When you take um, customer data, there are various stages at which 
the customer's data can be used for uh, different services. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you uh, you have you'd want to deploy a loan service. What you normally do at the back end is the customer transaction data, how many times you're stopping up and all of that. You do what we call the, the scoring. Now, for you to be able to lend to a customer, you should be able to know who the customer is. That is yeah. the first uh, uh, point. So as part of building whatever product you would want to take to market, that element of customer data usage and uh, customer data protection has to be built as part of the product. So for example, before you even access a loan, the terms and conditions must be very clear. Yeah. You cannot share customer data when I have not requested for a loan, for, for instance. Yeah. The data can only be made available to the lending institution, which is the bank who has been mandated to offer loans and services to customers within the financial yeah. uh, space. At the point of accessing a loan, for instance, when you access a loan, then you give consent to the lending entity to know that I am lending to customer A, B, and C, just so that the, the institution or the bank or the financial institution is also comfortable with who he's lending to. Yeah. These are all AML checks you do at the back end yeah. to prevent anti-money laundry and, and all of that. Yeah. So in terms of building the product, the customer protection, data protection bit has to be part of your product build up from day one. Um, Paul made a, a point about uh, how do we ensure that uh, the uh, fintechs have access to uh, certain products in, in collaboration with the banks and how do we build that uh, customer consent uh, element into it. So the product configuration from day one needs to uh, take into consideration how do I ensure that the customer information is protected? That is yeah. the first step. At what point or at what stage in the transaction process do I make available the customer information or data that is required for the transaction to complete? So if you have a, a whole base that is accessing a, a loan facility from you, you only release that information when the customer has actually accessed the data. At that point in time, by regulation, you are required to know who you are lending to. Okay. Yeah. So such products at that uh, stage in uh, the transaction process, you are very sure and comfortable that the customer has now given consent because you would have captured uh, the terms and conditions appropriately for customers to, 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 to read. The, the other leg, which is also um, about regulation, has to do with the regulator himself being in tune with technology. Yeah. What we normally try to do is we try to put uh, barriers and restrictions to protect the ecosystem. In doing that, we are likely to also restrict and inhibit growth. So as much as possible, uh, as much as we would want to uh, protect the space in terms of uh, fraud, AML, and all of that, mm -hmm. it is important for the regulator to also be up to date with what uh, the trends are, uh, what technology is uh, trending, uh, what time it is. Now, when the regulator is updated, it makes it easier for that interaction because from somewhere 2016, when we're building, we're developing the payment systems uh, 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 bill, uh, Carl was a, a key, a key, a key uh, member of the people who worked on this document and myself. What happened was that we finished preparing the document and we realized that uh, fintechs were not included. So as much as possible, the regulator also needs to understand where the space is moving, what time it is. Then once you are updated with technology, it becomes easier interacting. Instead of seeing the, the negatives of what the uh, fintechs can bring on board, you are able to put in structures that will curtail all these things and rather enhance participation and collaboration, which will actually build uh, the ecosystem and uh, build the kind of uh, infrastructure we need to drive uh, Okay. Uh, the payment systems. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, we'll open it up to the any questions. Uh, maybe we'll take three and then uh, take another three. So I see one uh, in that section of the room. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Diana John and I'm from Mahi Retail Medics. Um, this issue of patient um, um, consent. Okay 
is really important for any um, service, whether it's finance or whether it's in my field, for example, um, telemedicine. Now, once you, you talked about um, patient consent, what about non-repudiation? I haven't heard anything about that, but it's important that not only does the uh, patient give cons or patient or mm -hmm. the customer give consent, but that the transaction itself cannot be uh, rejected by either party. So in your systems and processes, how are you addressing that? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Sorry, the lights up here. No? You guys know everything about fintechs and technology and finance? All right, here we go. There's one more. My name is Fuseni again. Um, I wanted to find out, with startups, how do you begin to engage with institutions like this, um, with yeah. big structures and sometimes headquartered in other countries? How do you begin to uh, engage with these institutions to you know, collaborate and build innovations? Mm -hmm. All right. And then uh, let's take one last one there. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Akasho Clement, NCA. Uh, my question or yeah, question goes to the operators with technologies, especially mobile money. It has been good for us, especially people from the rural areas. But what have they put in place to ensure that the customer or the consumer is well protected because I've seen a lot of customers being harassed by mobile money operators. And the problem is coming because SIM card registration, most of the people are not able to register their SIM cards. So their identities are not able, you can't trace the person to the SIM that is being used. Mm -hmm. All right. So how do we protect the customer so that those harassments will stop? All right. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, maybe you want to take the one on how you end up talking to the big organizations to, to get them engaged. And maybe, Patrick, you can also give some advice on when a FinTech approaches you, what well, that will happen. And then. Um, all the, the SIM card protection and fraud issues and uh, repudiation uh, as well. I'll, uh, I'll have the two of you uh, answer that. Well, so I'll give you a classic use case. Um, when we started this company, uh, my company inclusive, one of the things that we set out to do uh, was that to achieve a big vision, like what we say, we say we want to connect, um, we, don't, we want to be able to connect Africa to the global economy. How do you do that? It basically boils down to you going to the internet and looking for what's available. One of the things that we did was to apply for a grant from the Gates Foundation. And we searched for that information online. You, we spent hours and hours looking for funding opportunities that exist globally. And people who would understand our vision and be able to reach out to us. So it's as simple as going online and searching for what's relevant. Don't forget, the internet is what? Garbage in, garbage out. So what you put in, you'd get the output, right? So you should know how to refine your, uh, um, uh, uh, your search. The other thing about protecting the sanctity of a transaction, I think that when we are talking about ID, you know, verifying an ID is not only about when an ID is issued at a point in time. Usually, if someone is being registered today, probably, for example, they wouldn't be married. In the next two years, they might be married. So a verification of an, an identity is not at point of issuance alone. It's actually the behavior that happens between those two points. What has the person been doing between when he was not married and when he was married? That is how you analyze a behavior. And, and you know, in previous panels, we've talked about big data, machine learning analytics. These are the kind of infrastructure that helps us to um, be able to understand the tons of insights that is inherent in all this uh, data that we are collecting. So yes, our infrastructure basically makes sure that we analyze the behavior behind the data that we have access to, then provide 
uh, a verification or a confidence score to say that we are 90 percent sure that this person is legit and you can do business with him take on um, approaching big companies is um, really don't. I mean, mm -hmm. understand the customer, understand what the customer needs, understand that um, the customer is part of a community and, and build something of value and, and the big companies will come looking for you. So I, I, I advise that that's the route you, you, you take. Um, I, the other side about regulation is, uh, apart from just getting the, the fundamental landscape the documentation mm -hmm. right for, for the ecosystem, there are so many um, parts, moving parts to, to yeah. the whole ecosystem. Um, and things like um, KYC documentation and, and now the National Bureau for KYC mm -hmm. documentation. So it's, it's really all intertwined. And I think we're on the right path. We just sort mm -hmm. of need to accelerate how quickly we bring everything together because it's not just um, servicing the uh, Payment Service Act going around. It's all the other intertwined regulation around understanding the customer that needs to be accelerated along as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so on my side, um, I can just say a few things really excite me. Uh, things around the digital um, addressing system, the national ID, because you see, we sit, uh, we sit right near near the fire, so we know. Um, kind of the pain that we kind of face when we need to take um, IDs of people and and you're not too sure about um, the ID. You look at the person's face, the person has really changed, put on weight, you can't question. He looks like a woman. You say, please, this looks like... And then it becomes a whole issue. You know, if you look at um, countries uh, like Kenya, where they have a national addressing system, a, a national ID system, I mean, every transaction requires that you actually show your ID. So for you to load money into your wallet, you need to show your ID. You can imagine if we start implementing that in Ghana. Okay, mm -hmm. so, but we are getting there with the national um, ID system. Once we have that, it would really help us because we need it to facilitate the kind of transactions that are happening on, on. so we are not too happy that we can't do it 100%. We are trying hard, but then we know that with these systems coming in place, it would help us do a much better job. Now, when it comes to engagement, um, one of the things that I spoke about was really around accessibility. And one of it is around um, smaller players connecting to bigger players. Look, you, it will be difficult for you to be able to connect and have 100,000 agents if you are not as big as a telco. You know, but then what you have now is that infrastructure is in place. And so you can take advantage of this infrastructure. I know that on the GSMA side, we've had discussions around uh, open APIs. Mm -hmm. And so we are all trying to standardize the APIs that we have. So you can, you can have an idea, you connect to um, a test box or a sandbox, and then you, you, t you try to know that it works, and then you can come through the process of uh, certification, and then you can connect and give access uh, to, to customers to actually take advantage of your, of your platform. So there are so many things happening on the side of regulation. So many things have happened, and so many things will continue to happen once we identify that there are maybe some loopholes here we are supposed to work on. So very positive. And then the question from there about the uh, repudiating uh, consent. So somebody can give consent, but then when the transaction actually happens, what uh, kind of leverage does the client have on that? In, in most cases, what happens is we try to get, uh, put in structures that will enable the customer to ensure that the transaction that he's actually uh, performing, mm -hmm. he's very sure about the transaction. So for example, even before you put, you put in the amount you want to send, it takes you to a next step ask you of the, uh, it shows you the customer's details to show that, are you sure you want to send this? Then it gives you a third leg that, uh, that actually questions whether, do you really want to continue? So what we try to do is that even before the, the transaction terminates, yeah. we've given the customer adequate room to be able to validate whether he's sure of the customer that he's, he's, he's sending the funds to. And I think it all boils down to customer education. One of the things that we, we have always been bat, uh, battling with has to do with how well is the customer informed about the processes that uh, a customer has to go through when he has a complaint. Yeah. So the key, the key item here is customer awareness. And we've had several engagements with the regulator. And uh, for example, the payment system department of the uh, Bank of Ghana is 
uh, getting involved in terms of how we would actually put in place structures to ensure the customers are well educated and certain complaints uh, resolution uh, 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 channels that will be uh, put in place. One of the most important channels is what we are actually building today, what we call the agent registry. That will enable uh, uh, the central bank to be able to identify every agent who does business with any of the telcos. Yeah. And then again, if one agent misbehaves on one platform, if one agent, agent uh, uh, performs any fraud activity on one particular network, we are able to identify that particular agent and he can be blacklisted on all other telcos. What we've seen today is that I perform uh, uh, fraud here and if I am taken off the platform by uh, uh, telco, tel uh, telco A, yeah. I continue to, to do business one. with other, other telcos. Now, yeah. what the approach we are taking will centralize that database such that if you misbehave on one platform, you cannot do business with the others, which becomes a, 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 key, a key point. Thank you. Yeah. The system. If it wasn't there, it would have been extremely difficult for us to, to, to do this. Yeah, yeah this so. is good. Um, so this is the end of it. Uh, thank you all very much.